life that you're really excited about starting a project. Whatever the new project is, is the greatest thing in the world. The second you start a project, you want to end it, right? And whenever I have an applied project, my I'm always trying to do the stupidest possible thing that will allow me to get out of the project alive. Um, unfortunately, the stupidest possible thing that could possibly work always seems to be a little bit more complicated than the most complicated thing I already know how to do. So in problem after problem after problem, I found myself having to write computer programs to fit models, usually some system set of approximations at different points, um, a lot of hacks, and that moved me towards a full Bayesian approach. And it seemed that often it was easier to go to the trouble of doing a full Bayesian model um, programming it, checking for convergence, that was actually easier than doing various approximate methods. So the old style statistics, I would try to come up with an estimator and then try to fix it, and that was just such a mess. So doing full Bayesian inference, I found problem after problem, I'd end up writing a computer program, and I noticed that all my programs looked kind of similar. So I had this idea that maybe I could write a very general program where you would you would just give the program the, the log posterior density, and then the program would figure out what to do. And originally, we were going to use iterative metropolis algorithms, um, but we had a problem a few years ago where we were reconstructing climate from tree rings, and it was very, we did an iterative, iterative metropolis algorithm, and it was super slow. It just wasn't moving around. When these algorithms are really slow, people think it's because it's multimodal and it can't get from one mode to the other. But in a way, if things were multimodal, that would be okay. Um, there was only one mode, as far as I know. It was just very slow to move through this high dimensional parameter space. It was a nonlinear model, um, and it was just the, the simple metropolis algorithm wasn't getting anywhere. So for that problem, we programmed up Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which solved our problem for us. It wasn't super fast, but it solved it. Um, so we decided to write Stan using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and then our collaborator, Matt Hoffman, came up with a no-U-turn sampler, um, which was an algorithm that did adaptive Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which allowed us to write Stan, which can fit a lot of models um, like just as a black box. I would say in practice, when I put models into Stan, probably two-thirds of the time they, they fit the first time. I don't mean the very first time. Obviously, you write a program, you have bugs. But once it's been debugged, most about two-thirds of the models that I ever want to fit just work. And then of the remaining third, about half of them, it doesn't work, and it turns out I can just add some prior information that I have available anyway, and then they work fine. And then maybe there's another sixth or so that are still challenging and we need to re-parameterize or, or think harder, which is, which is fine. Um, so I'm going to give some examples today. I'll start, wait a second, let's see, view, wait a second, okay. Um, this was from a couple of years ago, from 2012 to be precise, after the Soccer World Cup. We fit a model um, estimating the abilities of the 30, I think it was 32 teams in the tournament. I'm not showing all of them here um, just because there's not really room on the screen. We ha um, <laughs> the teams are ordered, the order of the team, Brazil, Argentina, Germany, etc., they're ordered based on an ordering that we found on the internet before the tournament started. So Brazil was seated first, Argentina was seated second so forth. The estimates that we have, the estimates and posterior standard deviations come from our fitted stand model. And as you can see, it thinks Germany is the best team, which makes sense since Germany won the tournament. Uh, it thinks Argentina is the second best team and, and so forth. There's a lot of uncertainty. This is correct. There should be a lot of uncertainty. There's not a lot of information in any given soccer game, and they didn't play a lot of games. Uh, this is our best understanding of what happened. Um, if you notice, after you do the, go through the top teams, at the bottom there's a lot more overlap in team ability, estimated team abilities. That's because most of these lower teams played fewer games. Most of them didn't make it out of the um, initial round. They only played, I think, four games. So then they really have very little information available about them. 
Um, <clears throat> this was the result of the model. Uh, here are the data. The, 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 on the left are the data from the tournament. We have each team, uh, the two teams in each line is a game. We have the two teams that played the game and the score of the game. On the right, we have the other part of the data, which is the soccer power index, which was that ranking that I told you about before the tournament started. This is characteristic of stand models or Bayesian models more generally, that they combine information. You usually don't have a data matrix, you have multiple data sets, and they all get put together. We took the soccer power index and we um, rescaled it so that the teams ranked the best. The best teams had um, scores of around, around plus one. The worst teams, this goes all the way down below the screen, you can't see. The worst teams had prior ratings of about minus one, and then in between they're equally spaced. That's supposed to represent a, a prior score uh, before the tournament started. Then we have this information. Here's the Stan model. Um, we typically read the model from the bottom up. Um, square root diff is the square root of the score differential. So if the game was 3 to 1, then the square root of the score differential is square root of 2. Um, we, modeled it, we modeled square root rather than the actual score on the theory that blowouts contain less information. It turns out that if you model on the original scale, you get similar results. This seemed more logical to us. We model the soccer game outcome given a student T distribution. It has slightly wider tails than the normal to allow for occasional outliers. The degrees of freedom could be set, could be estimated from the data, but here we set the degrees of freedom to seven degrees of freedom ahead of time to allow the occasional mild outlier. You're not going to get an extreme outlier in a soccer game, though. The key part of the model is the mean here. Um, it's the expected square root score differential is the difference between the abilities of the two teams that play. Then there's a sigma y, which is a standard deviation. You need that because game outcomes are not perfectly predictable. It's a hierarchical model, which means we have a model on the team abilities, um, and that's higher up. It's a regression model. The model is that a team ability um, is predicted by its prior score. That's that thing that goes from minus one to one. Uh, in a continuous range, indicating how good we thought the team was ahead of time, times a coefficient b. b is very important. We're going to get back to b in, in a moment. But b is the importance of the prior score in predicting the game outcome. Finally, there's an uncertainty at the level of, there's a, sorry, there's a team level error. Sigma a is the, is the standard deviation of the residual error at the team level. a to a is a random variable that's normally distributed with mean zero and and variance one. So this is the whole model. Uh, you also need, um, you can also specify prior distributions on sigma y and, and sigma a and b, which are the other parameters in the model. In this case, we don't bother to do that because they can be well estimated from the data. And then there's some more of the model I'm not showing here, which is declaration of the data. <laughs> we go into R to fit the model. We, we pull up R stand, we do some um, configuration settings for STAN to allow it to save the program and to allow it to run in parallel. When I run a STAN on my laptop, it automatically uses the four chains on my laptop. So it goes four times as fast as it would if, if it was in serial. You do a little data processing in R, uh, getting turning the team names into numbers. We set the degrees of freedom of the T distribution, and then we run STAN. Running STAN is very easy. It's just this one line. Um, you call STAN. There are a lot of settings. You can set the number of iterations and the number of chains and, and all sorts of other things, but usually I just run it in the default setting. It grabs the data from the R environment, and then I print the results, which look like this. Uh, <clears throat> I first look at R hat. R hat is a measure of mixing of the chains. You want R hat to be around one. If it's much more than one, then your chains haven't mixed, and you can't trust the results. I have my parameter estimates. B is 0.6, which is positive, which is a good sign. It means that when teams were had a higher prior ranking, they were likely to be better. Um, sigma A is the residual standard deviation at the team level, which is 0.13. That's a pretty small number, which this, this indicates that you can teams' abilities are pretty well predicted from their prior ranking 
which makes sense. The prior ranking is some expert ranking of how good the teams were. It makes sense that it should predict their ability pretty well. So the residual standard deviation here is fairly low. Sigma Y is the residual standard deviation at the game level, and that's pretty big, indicating that um, you can't predict a soccer game very accurately just knowing what the two teams were playing. And of course, that's correct. Soccer games are unpredictable. It all depends on how good the acting is um, and the penalty kicks. Then we have estimates of the abilities of all the teams. Um, <clears throat> the way we read the STAN output is we have the estimated mean, and then we skip a column and go to the estimated standard deviation. This is the posterior standard deviation. So my estimate of B is 0.46 with a standard deviation of 0.09. Then we have some quantiles. Um, N effective is the effective sample size because STAN does a, has, is a, runs a, runs Markov chains, basically random walks through the distribution of parameter space. Um, when we have 4,000 draws from our STAN output, the effective sample size is typically a number less than 4,000. So here the effective sample size is about 1,000, meaning there's some autocorrelation in the draws. That's fine. Some autocorrelation is fine. It's nothing wrong at all. You expect that to happen. We use the effective sample size to compute the standard error of the mean, which is the standard deviation over the square root of the effective sample size. This is called the Monte Carlo standard error. It's how well we estimate the mean. Um, we usually don't use this for much. Um, what's more important is this SD, which is the posterior standard deviation of the parameter estimate. Um, this, this represents our uncertainty in the estimates, and that's a good thing to know. Now, let us go on. This would then, having fit the model, we don't just stare at a table, we graph the estimates, and I showed you this graph before. Now I'm going to do something, I'm going to show you another graph in a moment. What we did is we refit the model and we took out the prior information. So we went back to this model and we spec instead of estimating B, we set B to be zero, which means we're ignoring the prior information and just fitting the model based on the data from the tournament. And I'm going, to sh I'm going to show you the results in a moment. Okay, so first memorize this, then here. When you don't use the prior rankings, what happens? Well, there's obviously a much weaker relationship between the ordering of the teams, which is based on the prior rankings, and the outcome. And there's just a lot more uncertainty. We still think Germany is the best team, um, but now we no longer think Brazil is so great. Um, the intervals overlap a lot more. They're wider. And that makes sense. We're using less information, so our intervals are wider. When our intervals are wider, it means we can't distinguish the teams as well, because we're using less information. Now, the question at this point is, is what should you do? And I think there might be a temptation to say that you prefer this to this. So I like this. This is the Bayesian estimate using prior information. But you you might prefer this because you'd say here you're not using any prior information at all. It's an estimate just based on the tournament games. Um, which you prefer is going to depend on your purpose. Um, I don't like this as much um, because it's using less information. The thing I wanted to emphasize is that we are not, this Bayesian estimate that I like, we're not forcing it to use the prior information. We're estimating this, sorry, we'll go back. We're estimating this parameter B from the model. So if the data showed that the soccer power index was a really crappy predictor, if it turned out that the prior information was not a good predictor of the outcome, then it would just estimate B to be statistically indistinguishable from zero. The fact that B was estimated to be positive and far from zero like this is telling us something. So we're allowing the data to tell us to take the prior information seriously. And I want to emphasize that because I think often in Bayesian inference, people think of the prior as this thing coming, the prior is information coming from the outside, but I think sometimes people feel like the prior is bossing the analysis around. But in this case, the analysis allows us to, to um, estimate the strength of the prior information. And the reason why we can do that is because we have 32 teams. So there's enough information in the data, there's, there's enough information in the data to, to verify that it's a good predictor. Now, I'm not saying that this estimate is perfect. In particular, we're assuming that the soccer power index has a linear relationship with the 
team ability. It could be nonlinear. You could go back. You could fit a nonlinear model here. Then we could add a quadratic term. You could do all sorts of things. At some point, you run. At some point, you run out of ability of the data to distinguish things. It is yes, it's 32 teams. Yes, we can estimate B. Maybe we could estimate a quadratic term. At some point, there's a limit to how much you can estimate. Uh, so, of course, at some point, you do need to make assumptions. I don't mind too much making this linear assumption here, um, but one could imagine generalizing the model. Of course, if you really wanted to generalize the model, you'd like to just use data on more games, uh, game, um, qualifying games and, and other information that you might have. Okay, so now what we've done, let's go through our steps. We've looked at data. We've constructed a model. We fit a model. We, we did some steps to understand a model by taking something out of the model and seeing what happens. The next step is checking the model. The way I'm going to check the model is once I fit the model, I can use it to make predictions for each of the games, each of the data points. I'm going to have it for each game in the data set. I'm going to have the model predict what's going to happen in the game based on that T distribution that we fit, and then I'm going to comp I'm going to take that prediction, use it to construct a 95% predictive interval, and then I'm going to compare the estimate from that interval um, to what actually happened. But here, here it is. The games are listed in order. As always, we we make graphs. Um, the games are listed in order of the time that they've been played. For each game, there's a 95% interval, 95% predictive interval. And then there's a dot, which is what happens. So, for example, here's Brazil versus Croatia. Uh, here's an, now the 95% predictive interval is kind of weird because it says that Brazil could win by 2.1 points. That's because it's a continuous model. Just as a side note, I we did I did refit a model that was discrete, um, and I got similar results. I ended up sticking with a continuous model because it was easier to explain. Uh, but anybody who noticed that it looked weird that the predictive interval included fractions here correct to note that looks weird. It's okay in this case. Anyway, here's the outcome. Brazil won by two. Uh, then we have Mexico beating Cameroon by one, which is well within the interval. Brazil and Mexico were tied, which is in the interval, and so forth. But now we see Cameroon versus Croatia. The interval was mi the score was minus four, and the interval is much narrower. If you go down, you see a lot more than 5% of the dots are outside the 95% interval. And that's bad news. It means something something went wrong. Now, what something went wrong, it could be a problem with the model, a problem with the data. It could be a bug in the program. In this case, it was a bug in the program. So I, I debugged. I went back. It took me a lot of tries. I tried a lot of things. I finally found out what was miscoded. Um, having Then I refit the model. Uh, the results, the estimates of the team abilities were actually pretty similar to what came before, but then when I did the predictive comparison, this is what I got. Now, actually, I, I changed, for some reason, which I won't go into, I changed the order of the games, um, but this is what you expect to see. 95% of the 95% intervals contain the, act, the ultimate outcome, and that's about what happened. Now, this is kind of too bad. Look how wide the interval is, but this is actually correct. It turns out that even when the best team plays the worst team, um, anything could happen. Uh, either team has a chance of winning. That's just the way soccer is. So the intervals are wide, and they're, they, are, they are honest. And that's the best that we can do here, um, given the information we put into the model. Uh, what are some lessons from this example? So the first is that even if your only goal is to predict who wins and who loses the game, it's a good idea to model the score differential um, <laughs> because there's information there. In fact, maybe even better would be to have a model with separate parameters for offense and defense of the team. So it's more complicated, and we didn't do that. But you definitely want to model the score differential. This comes up in a lot of applications. So in education, if you want to see what it takes to help a student pass a test, you shouldn't do a logistic regression model to predict whether they pass the test. You should do a um, continuous model to model their, um, their score. In modeling elections, you shouldn't model whether someone wins or loses. You should model the continuous vote, even if all you care about is wins and losses, because there's information there. Um, this, to a statistician, this is an obvious point. But in many, many areas of applications, I see this mistake made. 
all the time. I see, I'll actually, you, you'll actually see like in, in medicine, there might be a threshold where if some uh, medical measurement is higher than a certain threshold, you're said to be in trouble. And they'll, ju they'll do a logistic regression to model whether someone's above the threshold. And in economics, I'm always seeing them model I, when economists study political science, they're always doing this thing where they model whether someone wins or loses the, the election. It's called a reduced form model. And it's almost always a mistake. Um, you want to model the underlying process. That's part of Bayesian inference, really, that you're not just trying to model the data. You have the data, but you're trying to model the underlying process um, that, from which the data came. I didn't do that. He, with the World Cup, I didn't do the comparison, but believe me, if you do the same model but you only model wins and losses, your estimates won't be as precise. Uh, the next message is to just jump in and fit the model. My model had lots of arbitrary points. Did a, why did I use a T and not a normal? Why did I do seven degrees of freedom? Why did I use that particular scaling for the soccer power index? So what? You go and do it. Um, once you fit your model, then you have to check its fit, and then you can talk about improving it. But um, you don't need to sit there and stare at your data forever. Um, you can start modeling things right away. Combining sources of information, that's a point I already emphasized. And finally, this is the last point is something not always emphasized. That So I think usually we see someone, you'll see a paper and there will be one model, and that's what you see. Sometimes there will be other models, but usually when there are other models, they're only there as a for a robustness check. So someone fits a model and then they say, oh, well, I don't know, you know, maybe you shouldn't trust this result. Let's do a robustness check. And then they'll do, like, they'll change it a little bit, and then it's like, aha, we got the same result, right? So they have the model, they have like eight robustness checks, they all get the same result, and then you're not supposed to care. This is a little different. Here I'm saying I fit the model without the prior information, not to say that it didn't matter, but to understand how the information was coming in. So we use multiple model fits as a way of understanding what we're doing. I think that's super important because our model is always just one of many possible models we might pick. And you can't fall in love with the one model that you have. You need to understand it. Um, now I'll take a brief break from examples to over, give an overview of Bayesian data analysis as we describe it in our book. The first step of Bayesian data analysis is modeling. It's constructing a model, um, and I've talked a little bit about that already. The second stage of Bayesian data analysis is inference. That's mostly what Bayesian statistics books are about, including ours. It's about how to fit the model, how to estimate the parameters, how to work with the posterior distribution. Um, I'm not going to talk about that too much because Stan is supposed to do that for us. Well, I'll talk about the third part of Bayesian data analysis, um, which we don't hear enough about, and that's checking the model fit and improving the model. Um, so there are several steps of model checking. The first is, is do the inferences from the param do the model inferences make sense? So do the parameter estimates make sense? If you have a parameter that's supposed to be positive, is it really positive? Are the numbers in the right ballpark? Those can be set. What they are, what, when you ask whether inferences make sense, what you're really doing is comparing your inferences to your prior. Now, the reason why I say that is, do the inferences make sense? What does make sense mean? Make sense means, is it coherent with your general understanding of the world? That means, is it coherent with your prior information? So typically, do the models make sense is a comparison to prior information, which is not necessarily put in the model. You have a lot of prior knowledge that you don't put in the model because um, of sort of time constraints, if, if, if nothing else. Uh, the second step is to check whether the model's predictions are consistent with the data. That's what I did in that predictive comparison. Um, that's uh, called a posterior predictive check, and it's super important because we know that we can fit models that then don't fit the data, which seems sort of paradoxical. If you fit a model to data, how can you not fit the data? Because our models just have a small number of parameters in them. Um, our models are, are restrictions. In some sense, are, they're, they're lower dimensional summaries of the data. Um, so once you fit a model, you need to create simulations from the model and see whether it creates things that look like your data. 
problem. We're not interested in asking whether the model is true, because we know the model is false. All our models are false. I never work with anything true. Um, we are not interested in the probability that the model is true, because I know the probability that a model is true is zero. And we're not interested in rejecting a model. It's easy to reject a model, just get enough data. Um, every model will be rejected. And, um, the reason why we check how the model fits the data is because we want to find problems which will allow us to debug or expand the model in some way. And ultimately will allow us to include more information and include more data. Um, so that's our goal is, is to do better. And model checking is a way for us to see where we have fallen short. Now if you think about that, that means model checking is going to be always, it's not, it's not completely abstract, it's relevant to your goals. So we checked how the model predicted the score differential because that's what we're interested in looking at. Um, what is Bayes? What is Bayesian inference? It's many things. One way of thinking about Bayesian inference is it's data plus regularization, which means we can fit a model to data. When we have a big model and we fit to big data, our estimates can be very noisy. Um, regularization is a, ter a general term for taking noisy estimates and making them more stable. Um, the, another way of saying it is Bayesian inference is data plus prior information. Uh, we have data from the game and then we have the games and then we have this prior information and we put, put the information together. Uh, Bayesian inference is also presented as logical probabilistic reasoning. We have a probability distribution for everything that could happen in the world, and from that we draw out the implications of our models. And I just want to say it's different things at different times. When you're making decisions, you want to think of Bayes as prob logical probabilistic reasoning. It gives, you, it gives you probabilities that you can directly pipe into a decision analysis, and I'll demonstrate. Um, in other cases, when we're, just, when we're fitting data, the idea of regularization is very important, that if you do um, various simple methods of data in inference, if you do maximum likelihood or least squares, you can get very noisy estimates. And we don't want very noisy estimates, we want smoother estimates. Bayesian inference is a way to do that. In other settings, we have prior information, we want to incorporate that information into our analysis. And all of these are true at, at different times. Um, my second example does not use STAN, it's to demonstrate the different um, steps of a Bayesian analysis. I'm going to demonstrate the idea of prior and likelihood. Um, <laughs> suppose um, I have some text and I have the word R-A-D-O-M in my text. And I have this thought that maybe it's a misspelling. Um, maybe I meant to type random. Uh, maybe I meant to type radon because I actually do research. I've done research on radon gas. Or maybe I actually meant to type R-A-D-O-M. Um, and it wasn't a typo at all. Um, and I want a computer program to tell me um, which of these three outcomes is more or less likely. So I'll do Bayesian inference. I start with the prior. The prior distribution is just the frequency of these words in a large corpus of text. I got this prior distribution by calling my friends at Google and asking them the um, frequencies of the three words random, radon, and radom. Um, in their corpus. And as you know from Google searching, they don't use capitalizations. And, um, ran excuse me, random is the most common word. It appears um, almost 1 in 10,000 uh, times in the corpus. Um, radon is less common. It's about one-tenth as common as random. And radon is about, um, is another fifth or so as common. As, as radon. I was surprised radon is so common. It turns out radon, I googled it, it's a town in Poland. Um, so there you have it. Um, then I need a likelihood. The, the likelihood is the probability that I would type R-A-D-O-M conditional on the true word being random, radon, or radom. And these probabilities, again, the Google people came gave me these. I think it must have to do with the... So random, if the true word is random, it's quite unlikely that I would type radom. I would have to drop a letter. And apparently dropping a letter only happens in a, in a word of six letters, happens only about two times in a thousand. If the true word were radon, the chance that I were to type an, N instead, an M instead of an N, according to Google, is about one-tenth as likely as that. So apparently that particular substitution error is very rare. Finally, 
there, according to Google, if the truth were radom, there's a 97.5% chance of a type radom. So that must be something like the, 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 the chance that you type a five-letter word correctly. These three probabilities don't add up to one. That's correct. The likelihood doesn't sum to one. These are just three different probabilities, conditional probabilities. I put them together to get the posterior. There are three possibilities. Obviously, this is a simple simplification of the world. Uh, there's more than three possibilities. But in this simple demo, there are three possibilities. Each one has a prior probability. Each one, there's a likelihood for the data that we saw, which is R-A-D-O-M. Multiply them, and you get an unnormalized posterior. And then you renormalize them by dividing them by their sum, so they sum to one. And now I have the probabilities. There's a 67.3% chance I meant to type radom, a 32.5% chance I meant to type random, and then a 0.002 chance that I meant to type radon. And so from there, you can make a decision. Like, for example, if a spell checker, I mean, it might just not do anything because the chance is more than 50%. It's correct. I don't know how spell checkers work. Personally, if I had a 30% chance of mistyping a word, I'd want my spell checker to, to highlight it. So in my ideal world, that when I type R-A-D-O-M, it would flash, and, and then I, and it'd say, are you sure you didn't mean to type random? That seems possible. Um, now, what about model checking? How am I going to check this model? I need to, I'll, I'll, I think the natural way to check the model would be to compare to ground truth. So I, if I had this spell checker and I ran it on some document that I wrote, like Bayesian data analysis, I could have it flag the words that it thought were likely to be wrong, and then I could see how many were actually wrong, and, and that would give me a sense of how well it was performing. Now, I might not actually want to apply it to Bayesian data analysis because that we've proofread that a million times. I probably want to apply it to something new that I wrote, like maybe like my corpus of unposted blog entries or something like that. Now, what about model improvement? What I like, one thing I like about this model is that it's so obvious how it can be improved because the priors are based on Google's corpus, and really, if it's my typing, it should be based on my corpus. Um, there's a difficulty, though, because my corpus might not have enough words um, to get good estimates of these rare word probabilities. So what you'd really want is a hierarchical model that, part, that takes my corpus and partially pulls it towards the Google corpus where there's not a lot of information. So I'd actually want to use Bayesian inference to get my prior. And then the likelihood, I guess, you know, that I don't know how good it is, but I guess I could start typing a lot of words and, and try to figure out what's going on. Maybe the likelihood needs less revision. Maybe I'm an average typer. Um, so that's the end of that example, just trying to demonstrate all the steps of Bayesian data analysis in a simple, discrete setting. My next example, I'm gonna, it's going to be Stan. Um, somebody sent me this email, interesting applied project for your students, uh, real money on the line. I was, I was curious, so I clicked through. And I got this. I want you to read this. So spend a moment um, to read this, and then I'll continue. OK. So I don't know if you all read like I do, but if you read like I do, you saw right away that there's $100,000 on the line, so this is pretty exciting. Uh, the problem was someone created a 1,000 simulated time series. Um, some num the, and the simulated time series have zero trend, but then some of them, a positive trend of one degree per century was added. Some of them, a negative trend was added. And you're trying to identify which were the originals and which had the trends, positive or negative trends added. If you guess it right, you get, um, if you guess it right for at least 900 out of 1,000, then you win $100,000, which is pretty good. Could pay for part of a stand programmer, for example. Uh, each entry must be accompanied by a payment of $10, though. So is it worth it? Let's, let's try to figure it out. So I downloaded the data. And I plotted the data in R. Here are the 1,000 series. Um, <laughs> I looked at these series. It looks to me that they're basically linear. They're, ob they're obviously autocorrelated. Um, but my 
quick guess is that any given series, I can estimate its slope pretty accurately from a linear regression. My guess is that most of the information in the slope is contained by fitting a linear regression, even if there's autocorrelation. So what I'm going to do is each of these series, I'm going to estimate its slope using, using linear regression. I have just wrote a little R script to do that, to loop through the series, and then I plotted the results. Each dot here is one of the 1,000 series, and I'm plotting the standard, the estimated slope of that regression um, versus the standard error. Now, just a very minor thing, the slope was supposed to be plus, or, the, the added slopes were 1 or minus 1 per 100 years per century, and the data are in years, so I multiplied the slope and the standard error by 100 um, to get them on the right scale. It's a little pre-processing. Uh, looking at this, there seems to be no information in the standard errors. They just jump around the way standard errors do. They're kind of noisy. I, I, don't, I don't really see anything there, so I'm just going to look at the slopes. I'm going to plot a histogram of the thousand slopes. Now this kind of looks, it's like a unimodal distribution. If you look at it carefully though, it does kind of look like a mixture of three normals with one mode at minus one, one mode at plus one, and then one mode at zero. If you actually look carefully, if you really had a single mode, it looks a little too triangular. It looks, it looks a lot like a mixture of three. And of course, it's supposed to be a mixture of three normals, right? There's one with a mode at zero, and then there are some at minus one and plus one. So I'm going to estimate that. So I fit a stand model. This is the entire stand model. I, I knew I wanted to fit a finite mixture model, so I went into the stand manual and looked up finite mixture model, or mixture model, and I found out how to do it. I won't talk you through all the code. Um, you can look at it in your own time. The key is that we have, the key line is this target plus equals. What Stan does, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what what Stan does is it adds, um, it constructs a log posterior density. So in the model part, the in the model block of the Stan code. What it does, it what what you're doing is you're adding. You start. It starts with a log posterior that's flat. That's flat, like no information. And then every time you add a distribution or um or a target plus equals, it adds something to the log posterior. So when I say sigma is Cauchy 0, 2.5, what it does is it adds the log of the Cauchy density, um of of this parameter sigma, um with center 0, scale 2.5, to the log posterior. Then I have a prior on mu, and it adds that. Um, then it loops through the data. In this case, it's this mixture model. It, it loops through the end data points, and for each data point, it adds the um, mixture likelihood. Um, the mixture likelihood is constructed by adding the probability of being in the mix, the log of the probability of being in the mixture, plus the log of the normal density. This is LPDF, log probability density function. So it's actually sort of, this is the mathematically equivalent, this is the computing equivalent in C++ of the mathematical function for a mixture model. Um, so this is, I'm just putting it in directly and put, putting it in in a direct manner. Um, and there it goes, this is the model. Uh, having, I then fit the model, so I have the data, the, the, what, it, everything is vectorized, so why is a vector of slopes, it's a vector of length 1,000. Uh, I supply it with the number of mixture components. I tell it where the mixture components are. Actually, it would be very easy to estimate the locations of the mixture components from this data. I didn't do that because they told us ahead of time that some of the data are at zero, some have a slope of minus one, and some have a trend of plus one. So I just put that in. I fit the model. As usual, I just run stand and I print the output. There are four parameters in the model. These are the weight assigned to the three mixture components. So Stan estimates from the data that roughly half of the half of the chains, sorry, half of the, the 1,000 series are in the center mixture component. About 24% are at the component at minus one. About 22% are at the plus one component. And then sigma is 0.4, which is the residual standard deviation. Um, it's just it is what it is. How much variation there is in the, in the slopes. This is great, but this is, doesn't answer my question. Remember, my question is, should I invest $10 to try to win $100,000? So to do that, well, I need to actually estimate which chain is in which, sorry, which, I have to estimate which of these 1,000 series is in which of the three components. But I can do that. 
So I add to the stand model a generated quantities block. And what I do here is for each of the data points, I figure out the probability that it's in, I do Bayesian inference to figure out the probability it's in each of the three mixture components. Now, how do I do it? I actually do it the same way that, I, that we did the um, spell checking example. So I compute three P raw, these are unnormalized probabilities. You'll see what they mean in a moment. K is, big K is three. For each of the three mixture components, I figure out the unnormalized probability density that this series is in, that this, this time series is in that mixture component. The probability, I take the prior probability, which is theta, which is the mass of the mode, times the likelihood in this case, which is the normal distribution, the normal distribution probability of the data, which is the estimated slope, um, with respect to the mean and the standard deviation of that mixture component. X normal LPDF is actually normal, it's the normal probability distribution function. You might wonder why we hate, say X, the exponential of the log probability distribution. Why don't we just have a function called normal PDF? We don't have that because we're kind of bossy, and we we always want you to do all your manipulations in the probability in the log space. So on the very rare occasions that you need to compute the probability in the unlog space, we're making you do the exponential. So you don't, otherwise we'd have normal PDFs floating around. We'd have people having overflows and underflows all the time, and we'd be answering questions on the users list all the time about that. And then we'd be saying, no, use normal LPDF. So we just don't let you do that. Having done that, so we compute the unnormalized probabilities, then we normalize them by dividing by this. Um, now, I have to say, I should probably interject that if I wanted to make Stan look like the smoothest possible thing, I wouldn't have given you that detour. I would have just said, look, we figure out the probabilities, look how easy it is. I could have even pre-written a function to do this, and then I would just say, look, here's a pre-written function. But I really don't want to do that. I want to be honest that Sometimes it requires a little bit of programming. That's inevitable. Stan is so flexible. It can fit just about any model you can write. So a Stan program, Stan is a language. Stan is not a menu. It's not that you choose, do I want to do linear regression, logistic regression, log transform, square root transform, click on the menu, and then it does it. Stan is a language, so to speak a language, you can start by speaking the simple things. If you want to do more, you learn more, and you can do more. We can fit anything. Of course, I could have re we could have hard-coded this and made it look trivial, but actually, you could fit mixtures of normals, mixtures of beta distributions, gamma distributions. You can do whatever you want, and so because you can do whatever you want, at some point, you need to learn how to do it. That's why we have a long manual. Now, this is sort of an unusual problem. If all you, if you want to do hierarchical logistic regressions, that's great. You can do those in stand too. I think you should. And that's going to be a lot easier because various things have been pre-programmed. Here are the results. For each, there are actually a thousand of these rows, but for each row represents a, data, a, a line, a, a one of the 1,000 time series in that data set, it's the posterior probability that, that, it, that it's in the first mixture component, the second, or the third. The first time series, we estimate a 90, we have a 91% posterior probability it's in the third mixture component. The second one, it could be in the first or the second, but it's slightly more likely to be in the second mixture component. The third is most likely to be in the first component, the fourth is most likely to be in the first component, and so on. So we can do a lot of things with this table. This is an amazing table. The first thing is for each row we pick the winner. That's our guess. So we're gonna if we're gonna mail in our guess of who do who do we think which chains which which um, time series correspond to which of the three modes, we would say time series one goes into mode three, two goes into mode two, three goes into mode one, four goes into mode one, mode one 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 three one one two. That's going to be, that's our entry into the contest. But we can do more than that because these are probabilistic predictions, so we can also compute the posterior probability. We can also estimate how accurate our guesses are. There's a 91% chance, not only is this our guess, but we think there's a 91% chance that our guess is correct. That is, the expected number of correct guesses for number one is 0.91. The expected number of correct guesses for series two is 0.59. The expected number of correct guesses for series three is 0.93 and so forth. If I add up these numbers, I get the expected number of total correct guesses, which is my estimate of how accurate my estimate will be. 
But I can even do more because each of these, well, it might be right or it might be wrong. So 91% chance I guess it right, a 7% chance, 9% chance I guess it wrong, 59% chance it's right, 49% chance it's wrong, and so forth. What that means is that I can not only estimate my estimated number correct, I can also take p times 1 minus p, which is my variance, my estimated variance of the number of correct. I can add them up and take the square root, which gives me an, est an approximate estimate of my standard deviation of the number correct. And I do that. So I produce my best, so I produce the best guesses. It turns out I would guess 559, 1s, 232, 2s, 209, 3s. My estimated number correct is 854, so I think I'm going to, I think if I play this game, I'm going to get 854 correct, which is kind of a bummer because I wanted to get at least 900. I have a standard error of 10.3. N is 1,000, which is enough that I think I can use the normal approximation, so I can compute the probability of getting at least 900 correct. I use the normal density in R. I do 899.5 because a tie is a win. 900 is a win for me. So what's the probability of getting at least 900 correct? It's the probability that the normal distribution is at least 899.5, approximately 5.42 times 10 to the minus 6. I'll take one over that. My chance is 1 out of 184,000 of winning. So should I play the game? Well, we had a discussion thread about this on the blog, and, and there, there was this buffoon um, who wrote, why don't you guys just pay 10, I think he meant dollars, pay $10 to win $100,000. You don't need to accept that the challenge has any bearing on climate change, which is good because it has no bearing on climate change, uh, but it is a great opportunity to make $99,990. That's really stupid. It's a stupid thing to say. It's only correct if you knew you were going to win, but is this probabilistic? Um, so we can figure out the expected return. My chance of winning is 5.4 times 10 to the minus 6th. If I win, I get $100,000. So my expected return on this bet is, is 54 cents. So I have done now an end-to-end -end Bayesian analysis from data to decision making. And I have decided that it is not worth spending $10 to make an expected 54 cents. So I decided not to play. OK. I have one more example for you, um, and it's, um, I hate to give you another sports example, but then somebody assured me that this is okay because golf is not an actual sport. Um, these are data from an old statistics textbook. It's the probability of, um, it's, though the x-axis got blanked out, sorry. It's the probability that a pro golfer will make a golf putt um, given the distance from the hole in feet. So they make 90% of their two-foot putts, 80% putts, of their three-foot putts. They make about half of their putts that are five feet or six feet, um, and then their 20-foot putts they're less, less likely to make. Um, I did not collect the data, as I said. It's just data from an old statistics textbook. I um, want to fit a curve to the data. Um, so, well, the natural thing is to do logistic regression. Um, here we have it, um, uh, estimated curve. The logistic model, it kind of fits. It's not perfect. Um, of course, it's, it says, it, it, it incorrectly says that the probability of, it underestimates the probability of sinking a zero-foot putt, which, of course, would be 100%. On the other end, interestingly enough, it also underestimates the probability of fitting a difficult putt. So golf players, pro golfers, are actually better at long putts than the logistic regression model would predict. So I want to fit another model. Um, I'm not going to fit um, logistic regression, though. Um, I'm, going to, I'm, not, I'm going to construct a model from just based on basic mathematical principles. So here's a very simple model of golf. Here's your ball. It's a, little, it's a ball of radius r, little r. It's going into a hole of radius big r. Um, if the center of the ball goes within this dotted circle, the ball goes into the hole because more than 50, more than half of the ball is inside the hole at some point and it falls in. If the center of the ball is outside of the circle, then it never quite goes into the hole. So this is a simplified model of golf in which all you need to do is hit the ball between this dotted angle, within this dotted angle or the equivalent negative angle, and it will go into the hole. Obviously, an oversimplification in real 
golf, the ball can be hit too short, it can go too far, the ball can curve. But that's okay. Remember what I said. We just start with a model. So we're just going to fit a model. We know our model's wrong. We're not going to get all upset about it. We're going to fit it and see how, long, how far we can take it. This is how we do statistics. We take a model and, and, and use it for all it's worth, and we figure out where it fails, and then we use that to improve it. But to start with, you have to make the assumption you buy into the model. We're buying into the model. So the goal is to hit the, the ball straight, but you can't really hit the ball straight. There's, there's uncertainty. This distribution represents the distribution of angles. It seems reasonable to assume that distribution of angles is normally distributed because your angle is a sum of a bunch of little things that can go wrong. Um, presumably also reasonable to center it at zero. There's only one parameter in this model, which is sigma, the standard deviation of this angle. Given sigma, you can figure out the probability that the angle is within its dotted curve um, for any given x. It's just trigonometry. Now here's the stand model. This is the entire stand model. We have the data, the number of, we have the number of cases, the number of data points. In this case, the data points are different distances from the hole. Uh, n is for each one, we have the number of tries, x is the number of successes. No, sorry, x is the distance from the hole in feet, y is the number of successes, the radius of the balls. There's one parameter, which is sigma, which has to be positive. And then our model. P is the probability that the shot will go in for each distance. And this is phi is the normal distribution, cumulative distribution function. The arc sine is the trigonometry. This is just the probability that the normal distribution is within some range corresponding to the ball going into the hole, which depends on x because the farther, the longer x is, the smaller the angle needs to be. Finally, the data are binomial. Okay, not completely right, because golfers can differ in ability, but I think it's a reasonable approximation at the pro level. And then, this is so easy. You read in the data, and then I define what I need to define. The radius of a golf ball, well, the golf ball is a diameter of 1.68 inches, so you divide by 2 to get the radius, you divide by 12 to get in feet, and similarly the radius of the hole, and then you run the model. Again, this is it. You fit the stand model. Here are the results. Um, my estimated parameter sigma is 0.03. I multiplied it by 180 over pi to get it in degrees. According to this model, pro golfers can pretty much hit their balls within 1.5 degrees of straight. And now our fitted model, we, get, you know, we use the model to make predictions. Uh, here it is, and now I want to show you something amazing compared to the logistic regression. Is that like the coolest thing ever? Because our model has only one parameter and it beats the two parameter model. It, it correctly shows that golfers are still doing okay there. So this was just great. Of course, you don't need to use Stan to do this. You could program the model and run an optimizer or nonlinear least squares thing in R or MATLAB or whatever. But actually, it's easier to do the model in Stan. I can do it. I just wrote the model. This is the whole model. Okay, like, oh, I had to write a data block. It's just not that hard to write a data block, okay? And then I wrote the entire model. This is actually easier than trying to program something in an optimizer and, and put it in. But, and I also get some benefits out of this. Like, I get a posterior uncertainty. I get a posterior standard deviation. It's very small here. Um, I could do more. So what if I wanted the model to have, what if, what if I wanted the model to change? What if I wanted to say that, um, want to allow the model to vary by ability, and I had different levels of abilities of players. I want to put that in. I could put it in. It's, it's just open-ended. Um, but actually, I will use Stan for the easy problems, too. This is just, this is going to be the way to go. Um, I had another example, which, as anticipated, I don't have time for. Um, so I just want to conclude by telling you why I have no concluding slide, because Stan is an ongoing project. Um, we can do lots of things, but we have a lot more things that we want to do. Some of it is user friendliness, writing a function for mixture models so that people who want to fit a mixture model um, can type mixture model rather than having to work with a log posterior. Um, some of it has to do with speed. Um, we, 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 can smooth, we do a lot of smoothing using Gaussian process models and spline models. A lot of those could be hard-coded and could run faster. Um, similarly, with certain big regression problems, we can, do, we can program out more efficient matrix operations. Some of it is actually better algorithms. There are some problems that are so hard 
that even Stan, the algorithm in Stan is, can be slow to walk through the parameter space. Some of it is approximate algorithms for big data. Um, there are a bunch of different dimensions um, that, we're, that we're working on. Um, but what's wonderful now is that we can do so much already. We really are eating our own dog food. I use Stan in, in my applied work. Lots of people do. Thousands of people use Stan in their applied work. And as a result, we're improving that much faster because we get all of people's questions and input from so many users and developers. So that is my conclusion. Andrew, th thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Is it still sharing my screen? It, no, it's, it is. Can you, okay. can, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so th thanks for that. Uh, that. That was great. Uh, we, we did have a few questions that trickled in uh, as you were speaking, so if you don't mind, um, I will uh, I will pose them to you now. Yeah. Um, so one question was, um, I, I think referring to the first example, uh, why do you have mu uh, multiple data sets and Bayesian approach as opposed to frequentist? Um, oh, so you have, in this case, the key part of the model, so the, 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 the sort of workhorse of the model is we, we have the data, and the data are modeled as a T. It didn't have to be a T. It could be a normal distribution, um, given the team level parameters. And you can, of course, you can estimate team, team abilities from raw data in a number of different ways. What really makes it Bayesian is that we have a prior distribution on the team abilities. But once you have a prior on the team abilities, it makes sense for the priors to differ because I know, like, I actually think that Brazil is supposed to be good and I happen to think that Australia was not supposed to be very good. So I want to put in prior information. Um, the prior information, this is a typical example in that the prior information comes as a separate data set. So it's, the, it's this prior score. Now I'm going to go back a second and, and show you the previous slide here. The data from the t this the first the main data set is on the left here and it has one line for each game in the tournament. I think there may have been 63 games in the tournament. On the right, you have one line for each team, so they're not they're like on different scales. Um, the thing on the left is a data set which has one line for each data point. The thing on the right has one piece of information for each unknown parameter in the model. So ba that's basically why prior information. Ultimately, prior information represents prior data, so it's very characteristic of Bayesian analysis that you have two or more data sets. In fact, you can easily have three or four or five data sets if you have different sets of parameters. So, Great. for example, in a political, thing, political analysis of polls, I might have prior information on different polling companies, but I'm also interested in state-level opinion, so I have prior information on the states. So I would have a data set, a state level data set, a survey respondent level data set, and a pollster level data set, and they're all going into the analysis. Great. Uh, I think that also answers uh, a question that was posted after that, uh, which was, what does it mean for priors to be estimated from data, which I think is a, is a great uh, question. Right. So this, if they say, you know, it's turtles all the way down. So at some level, you have priors that aren't estimated from the data. Um, so in this example, I have my parameters A, which are the key, the most important parameters in the model, have a prior. The prior for A is based on the prior score. But this, in turn, depends on B and sigma A. So B and sigma A need a prior also. And this is a pretty simple problem, so I gave them flat priors. But in general, I might have wanted to put a prior on. So like maybe it would make sense for B. B is how important this prior score is, so I, I could put a prior on that. Um, in just in, in general, it goes that way. So you have parameters. Um, the, your prior for the parameter can depend on prior information, but then there's what we call hyperparameters, which characterize the prior. The hyperparameters need their own prior information. So at some point you have to say like where you think the parameters will, will be. In a case like this where you have a lot of data and not a lot of parameters, like we only have three hyperparameters, which are B, sigma A, and sigma Y. 
they're pretty easy to estimate, so we didn't really need to worry about them. In other settings, we'd need to put prior information on them too. But if we wanted to, we could. Like sigma y is how unpredictable a soccer game is. You could put prior information on that. We know that soccer games don't end up being 100 to 3. Um, and we know soccer games are not perfectly predictable, so we have some prior knowledge. We didn't need to add the prior knowledge here because our inferences were fine as they were, but we could have. Great. Um, another question is uh, asking, uh, let's see, uh, I work on choice-based uh, conjoint uh, models. I think this is maybe from marketing. Uh, but uh, essentially, I deal with choice data A, B, or C. Is stand good for multinomial logit model? Um, yes, you can definitely fit multinomial logit. We we might have that even in in the manual. Um, the way you the way you fit there's two ways of doing it, and either will work. Um, the most one way is you can have a latent um, continuous observation, latent continuous data. Um, and then you can you can set Stan up so it says if the latent continuous is less than a certain threshold, the at y equals zero. If it's between 0.1 and 0.2, y equals one. If it's between threshold two and threshold three, y equals two, and so forth. Um, I think probably the most efficient way of doing it in Stan is to compute the probabilities directly. Um, so you can you can do multinomial logit by just working out the multinomial logit or multinomial probit by actually just working out the logit or probit probabilities. Also, if you're doing basic multinomial logit or probit or hierarchical multinomial logit or probit, you can fit them in RSTAN ARM. So RSTAN ARM is, a, is an R package that we have that has a few dozen pre-programmed STAN models. Um, it's supposed to it has everything. Just it has everything that's in LM or GLM or LMER or GLMER. Um, so all the basic linear and hierarchical um, linear and generalized linear models. But it also has multinomial logit and I think multinomial probit, which actually are not in GLMER. Um, it's it, multinomial logit and probit are not generalized linear models, but Stan can actually fit them just as easily. So thanks for that question because it gave me a chance to advertise how great we are. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. Uh, more, uh, more of a, uh, I guess, a method uh, kind of question. Uh, could you talk about the technique of Bayesian model averaging? What, what's your take on that? Uh, we've been doing a lot of research on that recently. Um, so Bayesian model averaging refers to the idea that you have several different candidate models. Like maybe you have some data and you fit it. You have different models that include different variables or different transformations of the variables in your regression or different functional forms. And you have several models and you want to get a prediction out of them uh, so you can average them. <laughs> I. I'll first say that I think the ideal solution is not model averaging, but continuous model expansion. So if I have different models that include different predictors, I'd actually like to include all the predictors in the model. That will usually require putting in stronger prior information. So I think in a lot of the Bayesian model averaging situations that I've seen, I think what people really should be doing is including all their variables and then doing um, using something like a horseshoe prior, uh, some sort of model that will allow that will shrink some of they'll shrink a lot of the variables towards zero. So a larger model that includes everything but doesn't just estimate things using least squares or the equivalent, but actually uses stronger prior information to regularize. However, if you feel that you must do model averaging, the way we like to do Bayesian model averaging is using what we call predictive model averaging. We're currently writing a paper on it, but it basically it's to use leave one out cross validation. Um, to estimate um, the predictive accuracy of the model for each data point. And then from that, you can construct a linear combination of the predictions that should have a lower predictive error than any given model. Um, great. Uh, there is a question, uh, I'm sort of afraid to ask it, because uh, um, that could uh, be a you know, several hours worth of response, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, it says, looks like most of the examples shown are predictive problems. Is, is Stan also good for causal inference? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I certainly hope so. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, so 
there is, let's talk about causal inference. So the simplest causal inference is you have a clean experiment or a clean observational study and you're running a regression. So yes, you can run a regression using STAN. Why is STAN good for causal inference here? Because in the causal problems that I've seen, treatment effects vary. Uh, you have a treatment effect, um, but there can be treatment interactions. I think they can be very important. Often we don't want to, we don't estimate treatment interactions in classical statistics because when you fit a model with treat the interactions tend to have when you do regular when you do least squares and you estimate treatment interactions the um, interaction coefficients tend to have big standard errors um, in a lot of causal problems it's enough work just to get the main effect to be statistically significant you start throwing in interactions you have stand, big standard errors everything becomes a mess. Um, in Bayesian context, you can partially pull the interactions towards zero. You can put pri a prior on them um, that says that interactions are typically that, that they come from a distribution peaked at zero. And as a result, you can estimate more. You can, you can allow your treatment effect to vary over time or vary over space or vary by type of, of person. So my first statement about causal inference is if you're in a simple setting, simple clean experiment or clean observational study, you're going to run a regression and you're going to be happy anyway, then I'd say, hey, run a regression with some interactions, allow the treatment effect to vary, see what the data tells you, don't get all hung up on statistical significance, be happy if you, you get estimates and you get big uncertainties, sometimes it can still help make your decisions um, so you're no longer limited. Okay, so that's number one. Number two problem of causal inference is you have a harder, a more difficult observational study where you want to control for a bunch of things. Uh, in that setting, you can run a big regression and you can include as predictors um, the things that you want to control for. And you can include lots of interactions. You, if you have continuous predictors, you can include non-parametric models like Gaussian processes. We're doing research on that kind of thing right now for causal inference, but right now you should be able to fit such models. Um, number three problem of causal inference are models like instrumental variables, uh, simultaneous equation models. Related to this are measurement error models. So those of you who have econ training will know about the problem that if you have a predictor, uh, if, if the treatment, if the if the key predictor, like the treatment um, variable, is measured with error, that will cause you, in general, to attenuate your regression coefficients. Um, it's very easy in stand to fit simultaneous equation models. It's very easy to add to take to do. Um, instrumental variables or measurement error models. I think we have a section in the STAN manual on measurement error models. When you have measurement error or IV, when you have multiple equations, you just put them in. So here I happen to have a STAN model right here. Let's suppose, well this is perhaps, too, okay, let's suppose this prior score was measured with error. We could have another line in the model saying that it's measured with error. If anything is measured with error, you just put it in. If you have an instrumental variable, you can throw it in. So there's the potential for a lot. I would say the only thing lacking here is experience. That we don't we don't have a cultural experience of fitting lots of Bayesian models for causal inference. So we're still, as a statistical community, we're developing the expertise in these. I think STAM will allow us to fit more of these models and get a better sense of the practical pitfalls. Uh, great, thanks. Next one is, I think, is uh, short and easy. Is Stan able to solve ODEs? Yes, Stan is able to solve ODEs. We, we, I'm not the expert on this, um, but we, um, we pro, we took an ODE solver. Um, we've programmed various, we've, we've taken various ODE solvers that are out there in the open source world and we've incorporated them into STAN and the STAN modeling language has it, like you can type ODE, blah, 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 give the information and it does it. We're, we're using it in like pharma, pharmacology among other application areas. Uh, great. Uh, another question, uh, is the hierarchical regression model you fitted equivalent of adding categorical variables? to a simple regression model. Yes, the hierarchical regression model is equivalent to adding categorical variables um, and then putting a prior distribution on their coefficients. Uh, we find that a bit of an indirect way of doing things and we find it more, I think the hierarchical model seems like a more direct way of, of parametrizing that. The thing about adding indicator variables, a lot of that is sort of old school, like how to trick your regression program into fitting models like that. So since we can model it directly, we don't need to trick it. Right. 
Here's one of your favorites, I think, Andrew. Uh, could you comment on Bayesian approach to multiple comparisons? Oh, um, yeah, I, I prefer fitting a hierarchical model. Um, so if I have a setting in which there were many possible effects that could be studied, I would recommend including all of those effects in the model and then giving them a prior in the same way. Like this is a this kind of prior here um, in which I might have a prior score, which is how strong I thought that you thought the effects were going to be based on your prior theory. And then you have some uncertainty. If you have no prior theory, um, I don't think people do research with no prior theory, but if you have no prior theory, just don't put in a prior score. Take this shaded part out of the model and then you're just partially pooling the effects for zero. Now the only thing I, I would say about this is I might not just use a normal model. Uh, I, pro I might use a mixture model which allows for some effects that could pull towards zero and some effects that could pull towards um, a different mean. Um, I might even um, I might use something like a horseshoe prior which is a um, which is a model that, um, you know, there was, it's funny that you asked this. Um, I, might, I, might use a, I might use a horseshoe prior um, or a double exponential prior that pulls, um, that allows things to, uh, certain effects to be pulled much closer to the mean and, and other things further away. So a lot can be done with the, with the prior and with the distribution. The prior that you fit will probably have hyperparameters so that the data can tell you how much is shrunk. Now, Getting back to step back on this, what if you have a multiple comparison setting and actually everything is noise um, and you fit, you fit this model, what it should do is estimate the hyperparameter that corresponds to how big the effects are. That hyperparameter should be estimated to be close to zero. So it should basically discover from the data that the data are equivalent to nothing much going on. Uh, if there are a few large effects, then ideally um, the model will, will find it. So I do recommend looking all looking at everything at once, um, not looking at the thing that happens to be largest and then doing a multiple comparisons correction. Um, great. Let's put perhaps a, a, a follow on. Uh, can you provide some guidance on thinking about when deciding to use a stronger or weaker prior? Um, I will. Okay. So. Let's we put when do I sort of cheat and use too weak a prior and when do I cheat and use too strong a prior? I cheat and use too weak a prior when I think that my model is pretty simple, my data are strong enough, so I just don't want to have to worry about it. Like as in the example that, that's shown here, um, it's still on the screen share. I cheat and use too strong a prior when I think the model might be hard to fit and I want to really control it and understand what's going on. Um, so then, like for example, let's suppose I have a model, like here, I set the degrees of freedom of this t distribution to 7. I didn't estimate from data. Why not? Well, I have this feeling that degrees of freedom of the t distribution are kind of hard, hard to estimate. I'm a little worried about the degrees of freedom being too low because I really know it can't be too low. Like, there's no way a Cauchy distribution would be appropriate because, again, we don't have soccer scores like 3,000 to 1, right? So I... I have prior knowledge, in my, and actually I think it could be that the normal is pretty good, but I, I have prior knowledge that, that the degrees of freedom can't really be too low. I sort of want to set it to be not too high because I want to give it a chance to find outliers if there are any. So I'm cheating, I'm put, I'm cheating by putting in a super strong prior, setting it equal to 7. I mean, that's a very strong prior. It's a, it's a delta function because I don't really want to worry about this, and I feel like I have some prior information. And and, and it's, it's somehow it's not so important. You could say I'm also doing it the, with the square root transformation. There's a lot of transformations I could do. I'm just hard coding it. So there's something in between hard coding something and letting it float freely, which is a super strong prior. So in my analysis, I, I will typically, maybe because of my training as a statistician, I'll typically start with the super weak prior and hope it works. And if it doesn't, I'll start putting prior information in. And, and, and there's this thing where you put a little prior information in, it can make things more stable. Then you put more prior information in, and it rules out some unreasonable possibilities. At some point, you have some choices to make. about like, And that's real. At some point, you actually have to interrogate yourself and say, what information do I want to put in the model? Um, but sometimes you don't need to get to that point. Um, great. 
Um, there, there's a question that, uh, that I can answer. It's, uh, it's asking, uh, is Stan able to communicate with other command line programs? Uh, so St Stan is a, um, uh, even though most people call, call it from R, uh, it's its own programming language. Uh, you write what you see in the screen right now is Stan code. Uh, that is, gets translated into C++, and then C++ gets compiled to your target platform, and then you have an executable there. Uh, so you could run Stan standalone, and we often do that, uh, especially when we're putting Stan in the middle of some kind of analytic pipeline. Uh, and there, you you know, you can communicate with it through the shell uh, or however else you want. So so uh, yeah, we we can do that, and we do do that. Um, there is a question. Uh, about as we're sort of wrapping this up, I think this is uh, maybe a good one to, to take. Here, just by the way, here's Stan oh. here. Right. So Stan has interface. Well, it has community. So if you have questions, you can you can actually join the users group, which is free, and ask questions. And people do that all the time. And there's a network effect, which is when people who know the people who ask the most questions are typically the people who know the most because they have the most questions, and then they end up answering other people's questions. So that's great. Uh, we also have a developers group, which has many people. Um, uh, we have interfaces. So if you go to the interface, we have R stand, Pi stand, Command stand. Command stand is the is the the thing that uh, Eric was referring to. It can also be run from MATLAB, Julia, Stata, and Mathematica. Um, so it's all it's all there. Do you want to plug the uh, conference real quick? It's under events. Oh. Events. Oh yeah. So under events. Um, oh, docs. By the way, is the Stan manual, which like you just have to see it to believe it. Bob Carpenter wrote it. It's like a. It's like a book. Um, events. We have meetups. Um, so yeah, there's a Stan conference in New York. Um, that's um, on the twenty first. On the January twenty first. Yeah. Oh, and also this picture. This is the Stan logo, and this picture represents the no U-turn sample, or Hamilton. It represents Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is the algorithm that Stan uses to make efficient, do efficient sampling through a posterior distribution. Great. Uh, so we'll do the the last question uh, about you know what are some of the good introductory texts or materials. For getting started with uh, uh, Stan and with uh, Bayesian uh, inference, what would you recommend for that? So to get started with Stan, I would pick your interface like R or Python and just start doing it. Uh, if you go, if you, it's very logical, you go the quick start guide. It actually starts with an example. There's a there's a model that you can fit and um, do stuff with it. Um, so right away you can you can play with Stan. Uh, the Stan manual is you know, it's a manual, right? Um, so it's not maybe the best thing to start first reading, but you can actually download it. That was quick. Um, you you can, the early chapters of the Stan manual provide a lot of background. Uh, there's our book. We have um, Bayesian Data Analysis. I think that's kind of readable. There's also a book by Richard McElrath, um, which is here, at, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so here it is. So. Here's Bayesian data analysis, which which I like. I think it's super clear. Um, Richard McElrath wrote a book, Statistical Rethinking, um, which is super readable, and it, it actually like he has a lot of the same philosophy that we have. So I recommend his book also. Um, then some of the other books we have here in the books are refer to particular sorts of models. You know, they could be useful for you too. And this is all. If you go to the stand page and go to docs documentation, you'll you'll find all these references. Okay, great. Well, we we uh, going to wrap it up. Give people ten ten minutes back of their time. Thank you so much uh, for spending the time with us. Um, we will post the video uh, on our website uh, and on YouTube. Uh, so we'll have a follow up email uh, to everybody with a recording. Uh, and uh, would you make the slides available, uh, Andrew? Yeah, um, yeah, I can do that, sure. Okay, so then uh, we'll also send out the slides. Uh, so thanks again, guys, for tuning in. Uh, this was great. Uh, stay tuned for, for future events. Uh, and I hope that some of you can come to the, to the uh, STAN conference, uh, as mentioned, in New York uh, in January. Uh, so that, that should be lots of fun as well.
Okay. All the best. Okay. Bye.